So we got this 98 Chevy Silverado. It was towed in for a crank nose start condition. It was here back in the end of October of uh, 2020 and I put a uh, fuel pump in it because it had low fuel pressure. It cranks fine, it makes no attempt to fire. So we're gonna scan it and see if there's any data that will point us in the right direction and possibly check fuel pressure. So we're gonna check it for codes in the transmission computer, or engine computer I should say, no codes. Got the key on. Let's go into data and have a look at data. Engine data. See if coolant temperature readings and barometric pressure readings and throttle position are good. And I'm going to answer the phone. So the check engine light is on with the key. Let's see if the tack works when it's cranking. It does. It seems like it fired when it stopped cranking. But I got no communication with the scan tool. Unless I ID'd this wrong, but I thought I loaded the last ID. But I just scanned it a second ago and I had no codes, no communication. Let's go to codes menu, display codes and see if all powertrain codes. That's weird. I got communication to retrieve codes, but no data. So we got a PCM that's failed here. That's weird. I got to check the VIN. Gauge attachment, turn the key on. 55 pounds. 60 pounds. And it fired there. I wonder if we got weak spark or something. We got good fuel pressure. So I've got a uh, spark tester connected to the spark light here. You can find the trouble light here. There you can see it there. And uh, got a switch on the starter relay so that I can crank it while I watch it. I'm going to turn the key on. So we're checking for a spark at uh, number two cylinder. No spark at the spark plug wire. Let's try reducing the, usually it should jump about a three quarter inch gap. So I suspect, the customer had said he checked for spark, but I bet you he didn't have a uh, calibrated spark tester like this. Let's try it now with about a quarter inch gap. Well, it fell down. Let's try this again. got weak spark. So we'll check it at the coil. Maybe the coil's arcing to ground or maybe the distributor cap or rotor or the rotor might have a hole burned through it. We're going to check it at the coil now. So now I got the spark tester connected right to the coil wire. Coil up the wire. spark at the coil but no spark at the plug or weak spark at the plug so it's a problem with the cap and rotor so let's take the cap and rotor off and have a look in there well no smoking gun here the distributor cap looks pretty clean no signs of carbon tracking no moisture in it that oxidation on the terminals is pretty much normal and the rotor which I've seen burn through a little pinhole right there but not on this one So the only other thing I can think of is it might be out of time and the rotor's not lined up with the appropriate spark plug tower because I can't see anything wrong with this this rotor there's no pinholes in it yet we had good spark going into the distributor but no spark or weak spark at the plug so if the rotor's not lined up with the appropriate tower because the chain is jumped or the distributor gear is stripped or something then you're not going to have a very strong spark because it's going to have to jump a big air gap inside the distributor cap. 
So we're going to put it up on TDC number one and uh, check to see if the rotor's lined up. So there's the spark plug on a number one cylinder. Pretty wet, pretty wide gap on it. Wow, that's a big gap. So you could probably use a set of spark plugs, but nevertheless, it was weak spark to the plugs. So I removed number one spark plug and put my compression tester adapter in there and then bumped the engine over until I felt compression then rotated the engine until the timing mark is lined up. You can see it barely down here on the balance there. See if I can focus on that. It won't focus. Anyways, it's really hard to see and you can't get the camera in there, but it's lined up to TDC. I've got the uh, rotor back in and looking at where it's pointing. On the distributor cap itself, I see this is broken, but that shouldn't affect it. This is number one, and number one tower lines up with that spot on the distributor. So I'm going to have a look in there and see if it's lined up. It should be very close to that, and it looks relatively close, but we'll have a look back there and, and see. Let's see if we can see it like this. It's not too bad. Get the wire out of the way. So that spot on the distributor right there should be number one. So it's a bit past it. Mind you, it does fire about uh, four degrees before top dead center. But if I turn the engine by hand, I can turn it quite a bit before it starts to turn the rotor. So there's probably a, lo a loose timing chain in this thing. Still, I don't think it's out enough to be affecting it. Hmm. So here's what I found. I put another uh, remote start button on this so I can crank it from a distance because when I crank this thing and I stress this coil, I set it a gap about 40,000 40, pounds. Oh, I don't have the key. Yes, I do have the key on. But you can hear it snapping back at the coil. But I look back there in the dark and I can't see it arcing. You can hear this one always sparks one last time after it stops cranking. And I can hear it arcing inside the coil, so this thing has got a failed coil. When it's under a load, it, it arcs to ground. That coil is original. Amazing. Yeah, it's still riveted on the bracket. Okay, so we got a new coil coming. We're going to change the distributor cap because it's got a busted tower here. And we're going to put a set of plugs in this thing because with that wide gap on the spark plug, you can see this wide gap here. It, it puts a lot of stress on the secondary ignition and the spark looks for an alternative easier path so coil cap rotor plugs got parts on the way so here's that coil out and you can see this gray spot right here between the laminated core and the plastic housing of the coil and the coils arcing through right there and it's on the inboard side at the back that's why I couldn't see it side here that's discolored as well. And that coil is original because it's still riveted in place. These going to be cut ground off these rivets to uh, remove this coil from this housing. So you have to grind off the aluminum rivets. These are aluminum actually these rivets that hold the coil on to there and the bracket on and the coil will come with two little machine screws and, and nuts. So it's back together, new coil installed, new distributor cap and rotor, new spark plugs. Uh, it didn't have platinum plugs in it, but I put platinum plugs in it. And uh, dielectric grease on the spark plug boots. I see that clip on that harness back there needs to be secure. Fuel uh, pressure gauge is off, and we're going to start it up and see how it runs. So let's see if it starts now. Be on. Okay. Go 
Well, just for shits and giggles, we're going to check spark at that plug and compare it now. So I'm going to uh, crank it now. I've got the spark tester on number one spark plug wire like I did before. And the gap set to about three quarters of an inch, which is about 30,000 volts. So, we'll call this one fixed. I'm just going to check the camshaft sensor offset to make sure the distributed gear is not worn because that would put a larger air gap between the rotor and the tower on the distributor cap when the spark is sent to it. So we're going to check that on the scan tool. So I'm going to clear the codes out of it because I would have generated codes by running without the mass airflow sensor connected. And probably mass airflow and intake air temperature, just mass airflow. So we're going to clear that out. And then we're going to go into data. And if I recall correctly, it was under accessory electrical data. And it's the camshaft sensor offset. Cam retard, there it is. It should be zero degrees, plus or minus two, but the reading is only live above 1200 RPM, so we have to rev it up. Well, that's good. It can go up to 10 degrees, either plus or minus, without setting a fault code. After 10 degrees, it's supposed to set a cam, camshaft sensor offset fault code. But understand, if, if, it, if the distributor is out of sync, and this one can be rotated, it's got a hold down clamp, and, it, and the V8s can be rotated, but you can't turn it much. If that gear on the bottom of the distributor is worn, this would typically be, you know, minus 10, minus nine. I've seen them as far as minus 15 and not set codes, although the code setting criteria says plus or minus 10. That would create a, a wider air gap between the distributor cap tower and the rotor alignment when the spark gets sent to the distributor. And that creates a higher than normal peak firing voltage on the secondary and it stresses the coil. But I think this is just age. I have seen uh, distributor caps fail internally inside the plastic so there's always a possibility of that you can't see anything wrong with it I'll show you what I mean by that so here's the distributor cap and this is the actual coil wire coming in and goes into the center here now you see the only insulation between this passage here is the plastic so I've seen it actually burn through internally in here and the coil spark gets sent to one of these spark plug wires, either this one or that one, and uh, yet you can't see anything wrong with the cap. But we've changed the cap, rotor, and the coil was arcing through the side, and we'll call this one fixed. Thanks for watching. Well, not so fast. Took this thing for a road test, and it started missing on number two, especially 2292 misfires. Yet it didn't set any fault codes, or at least it didn't turn on the MIL or flash the MIL. Fire on bank one, one, three, five, and seven, and two, four, six, and eight. Misfire on the, everything's misfiring. That's weird. But mainly on cylinder number two. And the misfire diagnostics weren't that great on these early vehicles. Let's see if it's set a code. Yeah, P0300 and P0137. Let's have a look at the fuel trims. Let's have a look at the fuel trims. I wonder if the fuel trims are uh, skewed.
not in this list. Okay, probably in the... Uh, well, it should have been in the engine data list. Maybe I should put my glasses on so I can see better. Well, there's the oxygen sensors. Tank 1, sensor 1. Peg rich. Tank 2, sensor 1. Both of them are peg rich. Hmm. Well, short term fuel trims are negative 30, and the long term fuel trims are negative 17. So it's either thinks it's getting extra fuel and it's not, because both O2 sensors are reporting rich. I know the fuel pressure was normal. I wonder if that pressure regulator is leaking inside the intake manifold. Damn. That would account for extra fuel. Okay, got to put the fuel pressure gauge on it again. So I decided before I check fuel pressure that I'm going to reset the uh, fuel trim and then start it and see how it acts. So reset. And it's not running, so I got time to, to look at in sensor data, wasn't it? Bank 2 sensor 1, bank 1 sensor 1. Why are they pegged at 940 millivolts? It should be 450 millivolts. It's not running. That's strange. Well, let's see what happens when we start it up. Let's look at short-term fuel trim on bank one, and short-term fuel trim on bank one and bank two. Let's start it up. closed loop yet. You can see open loop. It should go any second. And then these field trim numbers should go negative as hell. There they go. So do we have two poisoned O2 sensors? That's unusual. Or do we have a fuel leak and it's dumping extra fuel into the intake manifold? Let's put the fuel pressure gauge on like I was going to. So the fuel pressure is normal at an idle, 55 PSI. What happens when we shut it off? Now, if the fuel pressure regulator and the manifold is leaking, it would start dropping, and it's not. It should go up to about 60 pounds when I cycle the key on. 64, 6 stops at 60. And it's holding fine, so I don't think that pressure regulator is leaking. Let's unplug both forward oxygen sensors. So it just dawned on me why the uh, O2 sensors would be reading, because they're heated with the key on, they're going to start working. Now you can see the two rear oxygen sensors are sitting at uh, 17 and 4 millivolts, which would make sense, it's not running, so it's going to be, it should be fairly lean I would think. Why are these two forward oxygen sensors indicating this such a rich condition? So I'm going to force it to run in open loop and see how it runs. How could the two rear oxygen sensors be pegged lean, yet the two forward oxygen sensors are pegged rich? Doesn't make sense. And why would two of them fail at the same time? We don't have a fuel leak, at least not while I could see it losing fuel pressure. Notice the fuel trims aren't being corrected now. Let's see if we change this list here, if we've got misfires now.
number eight showing 28 misfires. This is all history from before. Now it's clearing up now. Hmm. Wonder if that went back into closed loop. Yes, it did. Well, I'm going to unplug those two forward oxygen sensors. Okay, so I unplugged both forward oxygen sensors. They look like they're original, believe it or not. Uh, let's reset field trims. And then go back into data. And sensor data and start it up. So you notice with both sensors unplugged, they, they're stuck at about 450 millivolts, which is the bias voltage that the computer puts on it. The two rear O2 sensors are reading lean. Now, they shouldn't be. They should be sitting around 700, 6 to 700 millivolts. That's strange. I wonder if he's got some contaminated fuel or something. I'm going to have to ask him if he put something in the fuel tank. seems like it's still got a miss, although not quite as bad. Number eight shows a miss. 18 misfires on number eight. Let's, let's clear the codes out and get rid of this misfire data. So clearing the codes should flush the misfire counts back in and look at misfires now. Jeez. Now what the hell's going on with this thing? Number eight, number six. Down. This doesn't have, uh, this misfire list doesn't have fuel trims. Not that they're working because it's going to be an open loop. Open loop. But the two rear oxygen sensors are, are pegged lean. Sure, the catalysts aren't working that good. What is going on with this thing? I wonder if I have at least one of those O2 sensors for the front. I can put one in that's functioning. Well, that's weird. So I installed a known good O2 sensor in place of bank one sensor one, and I plugged it in and turned the key on. And with the heaters working. Both the rear oxygen sensors go to zero, nearly zero volts, but this one's pegging at 870. And of course, this one's unplugged, so it's biased at 450 millivolts. It's not running. Why would they be indicating rich? Look, 900 millivolts. I wonder if the computer has gone south on this thing. That's really strange. I don't think I've ever seen this kind of situation before. That was one way to check the O2 sensor heaters on these trucks was to simply turn the key on because they were key switched 
and watch the oxygen sensor voltage, the bias voltage should go from 450 down to basically zero. But this one is sitting at 929. And this is a new sensor I just put in. I'm sure if I plug in this sensor, it's going to do the same thing. Hmm. Interesting. So I've reconnected the two original oxygen sensors. And I just turned the key on. And as you can see, bank 2 sensor 1 is climbing. And bank 1 sensor 1 is climbing. How can they be reading rich when it's not even running? And the two rear O2 sensors, of course, they went down to zero, or close to zero, 39 millivolts on bank two sensor two and four millivolts on bank one sensor two. Well, if these two forward oxygen sensors read rich like that, that'll account for the negative fuel trims and taking away 20 to 30 percent of the fuel from the fuel delivery will make it run lean on all cylinders it does run better in open loop with the O2 sensors unplugged but why is it doing this I wish I had another computer to plug in but I don't think I do I think that's where I'm gonna go next I think we're gonna have a look at the electrical circuit. I know that the O2 sensor heater circuit is ignition switch fed. I can't see both circuits being shorted to voltage. And of course with the sensors unplugged they work fine. So if the wiring was a compromise I would think it would do it with the sensors unplugged as well. Yeah, I think I'm going to try and source a previously enjoyed ECM and just plug it in and see what happens. We don't have to program it. We can just check to see what goes on with the fuel, uh, the O2 sensor readings, key on, engine off. So I've obtained a previously enjoyed uh, controller, engine controller, same service number, but it came out of an application with a 4.3 liter V6. Um, it's the same ECM, but it's got different programming in it, so it's going to require flash programming. But I should be able to plug it in, turn it on, and have a look at those O2 sensor readings to see if they do what they were doing before. So we're going to give that a shot. And then if, it, if they work fine, then we're going to go through the process of flashing this thing to this VIN number. So here's what's going on with this on this computer now. Bank 1 sensor 1 is going down. But what bank, bank 2 sensor 1 is going up. That's strange. Remember this computer came out of a truck with a V6. I'm pretty sure the V6 still had four oxygen sensors, but I could be wrong. It may have a crossover pipe and may not actually use bank 2 sensor 1. But this is definitely going down now where it was up to 950 before. So we're going to go ahead and program this ECM to this vehicle and then uh, see how it runs. So I've reinstalled the original computer in the truck so that I can get the VIN number because the aftermarket uh, programming is tied to the VIN if I put the used computer in there, it'll allow me to flash that that VIN, which is not what I want to do. So we're going to do a, a reflash here. I'm downloading the software from GM right now. Started at 5.15. Let's see how long this takes. When you're doing this, it takes quite a bit of time, and it looks like nothing's happening for probably about two and a half minutes it appears that nothing's happening. You'd think that the software is hung or something, but you've got to be patient as it says. Please be patient if connected via slow internet connection. Now I'm high speed here, but not ultra high speed. I started downloading the software at 521, I believe. So we'll pick up when it's installed. So we're going to go replace and program ECU. Next.
Verify, turn ignition on, next. And this is a Chevrolet, uh, not Holden, GM 700, no, it's not a, geez. Ninety-seven light duty truck CK pickup engine is any engine any fuel type gasoline it should pull the VIN from the vehicle I got the key on, I got a clean battery charger connected to it, set at 13 volts. Let me double check that that's correct. 89, Powertrain control module, next. Remove the existing controller from the vehicle, install new controller. So we're going to pause and I'm going to do that. Okay, so I've got the new used controller installed. Key back on. And it should have... Speedometer engine... What's the difference here? Current calibration, initial system calibration for production vehicles. Now this one would be good. Hmm. I don't know why it's grayed out here. Oh, I had to choose between the transmission calibration. There was this one here, which is new calibration for diagnostic enhancements, and this calibration for to correct chuggle surge on used on vehicles with persistent complaint only. Let's go with this one. We can always go back and do it again if we have to. This would be stock. And program. The programming process is usually fairly quick. It's important that you have a battery charger hooked up and it's ideal that if you have one that's clean, not creating electrical interference. Well, I'll pause this recording. Clear DTCs, and then we'll reconnect the snap on scan tool and cancel, and we'll go back to this. We've got to hook up our interface. Well, that's interesting. This one's still sitting high, bank one, sensor one. That was the one I had out. Well, let's start it up and see how it runs. Well, it's still an open loop, but both forward oxygen sensors are starting to toggle now. It just hasn't been run long enough where it's not up to operating temperature. Short-term fuel trim numbers are pretty negative, though. Mind you, it's still an open loop. Let's see what happens after it runs for a little while. Well, it went into closed loop about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Fuel trims are a little on the negative side, in my opinion. 
I'm, it's running okay. It seems to be running smooth. Let's uh, save this recording. So here's the four oxygen sensors. These two are in control. This one here is flat line lean, which is probably a dead sensor. This is catalyst monitoring sensor. And this one is switching too much. So this catalyst is probably compromised as well. It seems to be running pretty decent. I'm gonna take it for a road test and see how it runs. Well, as I expected, the two rear O2 sensors are pegged lean, so they're not switching. So they're gonna turn on the check engine light next drive cycle. And it has a P1870. The torque converter clutch is not engaging properly. So this thing needs some other TLC, but it's running decent now, decent enough it can be driven like this. But the check engine light is gonna come on. So we'll have a chat with the customer and uh, see what he wants to do. That's a wrap.